Let's get to the main event here tonight. I'm really, really excited to have Gib Biddle speaking here. Um, he uh, used to be the VP of product at Netflix. He was also, he dropped, Chegg dropped. He was former chief product officer at Chegg. Um, before that, he was the head of product over at learning company Mattel. He's got a long career, and obviously, in product management. He also was, he's a guest lecturer these days at Stanford. You can see him at, at Gibson Biddle on Twitter. Um, and GibsonBiddle.com. He's going to tell us how to hack our PM career. I'm, I'm excited to hear this. So let's give a warm welcome to Gib. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to bring you back to this summer. It was an Olympic summer, and I gave a talk in a space like this, and I was a little bit late. And as I was finishing up, they rolled out a freaking pommel horse onto the stage. <laughs> and so if you did high school gym, this is, a, this is a source of terror. It's a source of terror for me. And this Olympic gym, gymnast vaulted onto the pommel horse in front of me. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And he proceeded to do this talk. And he talked about what it takes to have a perfect 10 on the pommel horse. I'm going to use the old scoring system because it's easier for me. So, and, and he said, he, he jumps onto the pommel horse, and he says, I get 9.4 points out of a possible 10 for just freaking doing my job and getting on the horse. And then he does this wild dervish motion, a double, triple, saw cow, and, and swirling around, and then he stops in mid-action. I, I won't fully recreate this for you. <laughs> And they said, I get another three tenths for taking on creativity and risk. And then he's standing there and he does this amazing handstand, like the one that you see here. And he extends his fingertips and you can see his toes pointing. You can see the, the calves like muscling up. And he says, I get those last three tenths for extension. And that's how you get a perfect 10. And I thought to myself, wow, what a great metaphor for being a product manager. So what I'm going to do is talk about what it is as a product manager to get on the freaking pommel, to, to get those 9.4. I'm going to define the job and the skill set of the job. No, my, no laughing back there, Michael. I can see you. The second is about taking on creativity and risk in your career. And that's the career hacking part. And then the last is how you can extend via what I call a personal board of directors. And many of my board of directors is in the, is in the room today. And I'm hoping they will heckle. <laughs> All right, so part one, I'm going to talk about defining the job. So my, the definition that's worked best for me, and I'm sure you have, you've heard about being the CEO of your product, so the one that's worked the best for me is the one I learned from from Reed Hastings, who's the CEO of Netflix. The way that, that I learned to think about it with him was you love to build stuff and you manage to delight customers in margin enhancing hard to copy ways. And I have found this to be a really helpful way of thinking about how to do the PM job. So it's easy to delight customers in the context of Netflix. I think you'd all be delighted if it were free. But that's not delivering the margin, the, the shareholder value. And the real trick is doing all the work that together is hard to copy so some punk startup down the street can't knock you off in a minute. How many of you use Netflix? How many of you are paying? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care, you know. Kelsey's college is almost paid for. All right, so uh, let's... Is anybody at Netflix today? Okay, we're going to do a little work for Todd. Uh, so what are the ideas about what would delight you as Netflix customer? What, what, what kind of stuff do you want more or better of? Brendan, my favorite heckler. Can I find my damn, like, watch list without scrolling all the way? He wants it to be <laughs> wicked easy to find movies that he loves. What other things do you guys want? A catalog. What's that mean? The broad catalog. Oh, you want more stuff. Of course. Oh, of course. What do you want in the back? Same experience across devices. You want a consistent experience across different UIs. Wow, they're tough, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Bill did most of this work in the old days. So, 
Here's a, a, a list of ideas that, that, that people want more of. It's very consistent. So this is the kind of stuff. Did anybody notice you can now download and play back on an airplane on Netflix? Yeah. That's cool, right? So that's the delight part. The margin enhancing, again, fancy way of describing a business. And is, was anybody a subscriber when the service cost 22 bucks a month to get three DVDs that sat on top of your TV? Okay. <laughs> Today it cost about 10 bucks, and we experimented wildly with different prices and plans. Does anybody remember Netflix selling used discs? Oh, yeah. We were trying to figure out how the heck to make money. How about advertising on Netflix? We did that for about two years. These are all tactics, since we couldn't figure out how to make money, obviously did it. But the key one here is the long tail content. So in, back in the DVD era, we actually had a, about 100,000 titles available to you on DVD. Most of you know what a DVD is? <laughs> I know Dexter and D's, uh, they're still a DVD only household, correct? Yeah, we found them, the last customers of DVDs. <laughs> The long tail content, uh, in the old days of DVD, it cost three bucks to deliver an expensive new release that just came out into your household. It cost two bucks if that title were from three to 12 months, and only a buck to Netflix to deliver a title that was over a year old. And so the way that you'd figure out how to make money for the business was to find a five-star movie that we thought you would like that was also more than a year old. So that's an example here of, of margin enhancement. And then the hard to copy. You know, there's real, for me, it's pretty simple. Uh, the hard to copy elements of what, of what we all do is the brand, some source of unique technology and some network effects, and then economies of scale. So in the case of Netflix, the brand, it, 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 anybody want to start a streaming company and go up against Netflix today? Okay, super hard to copy that. The personalization is the unique technology. Today, Netflix knows the movie tastes of 90 million people worldwide. And they've learned a lot about people's movie tastes. They know, for instance, that the whole world enjoys a Hollywood blockbuster, which is surprising. I mean, it was surprising to them that there are a set of universal movie tastes. The device ecosystem, Bill, you and I, in the old days, we'd have five million members, and we'd have uh, the first streaming titles, we called it Steamy Romance, which is kind of code for soft poor porn, was the stuff that we could get. Uh, and of course, there was no way to watch this stuff on a TV, because we couldn't con Xbox or PlayStation Windows, or Wii. Windows, Windows. Yo, yeah, oh, what a great platform that was. <laughs> But by the time we had 20 million customers, now we could write big checks to get stuff that you'd like to watch. And we finally got Xbox and the PlayStation and the Wii. And finally, every Blu-ray and hardware manufacturer, all the devices today, you can stream to your television. And that's, that's an example of the device ecosystem, a very substantial network effect that's way hard to copy. That was me, Dan, not using the word wicked. Yeah. The economies of scale. Anybody watch The Crown from Netflix? It cost 150 million to build that sucker, right? That's Netflix can now afford to, to spend substantial checks to build lots of new titles that a punk startup just can't afford to do. Then that, that's an example of economy of scale that's very hard to copy. So in that job about delight customers and margin enhancing hard to copy ways, over the years, you know, I think about these different ideas as basically theories and hypotheses or strategies about how to make Netflix better on all three of those dimensions. And the big dog, if you think about it, has been personalization. So personalization, the idea is it's trying to make it wicked easy for you to find a movie that you love. Sorry. It also is unique technology, but the margin enhancement's there because they're helping you to find stuff that's a little bit cheaper that you'll still love. So that example of, of, of product strategy of personalization hits on all of those vectors. And today, uh, it's interesting, in the old days, Netflix tested exclusive content, and it didn't work. But once they got bigger, has anybody watched House of Cards? Okay, the original exclusive content worked fairly well in the later days. 
All right, so now I'm going to think about the skills of a product leader and the very different styles that, of different product leaders. So I, I brought up the archetype of a product leader. Think for a moment about what his skills are. And what, what are the skills that you think Steve Jobs has? Decisive. He's decisive. Innovation. He's highly innovative. What else? Perfectionist. Ah! Yeah. He's uh, very intensely results-oriented, is the nice way of saying that. <laughs> Driven. What are some other skills that he has? Commitment to the vision. Okay. <laughs> Commitment to the vision, and he can articulate the vision. What else? He's empathetic. He's looking for consumer insight. Way in the back. He knows how to say no. He knows how to say no. He understands the value of focus. Or got a clear strategy that he's sticking to. So these are some of the characteristics. Here is a different personality. Mike Podwell, tell us about the style of Jeff Bezos as a product leader at Amazon. What are his skills? Well, I'm no longer at Amazon. I know you're not, but you can make this up. This is called a cold call, damn it. Yeah, he's, he's, he's on the highest standards. High standards, what else about him? He's obsessed with customers. He, consumer insight is wicked important to him. What else? Does he care about the business and shareholder value? He does, but not in the ways that Wall Street would like him to. No, it's true. Is he strong strategically? Extremely strong. Yes. Irene Al, she's, a, she's now at Coastal Ventures. She was the person who brought design to Google uh, and design thinking and highly creative. Very different style from some of the others that I've described. Cold call? With Reed? Yeah. Just an amazing ability to, to say no to stuff and have clarity. Like, so many, so many times he would, he would shut something down and I'd go, what the hell are you doing? And it was brilliant. Yeah. So these are different styles of product leader. And the question I want you to ask yourself are, what, what's my style and what are my skills? So I'm going to help you out. So I have interviewed hundreds of product leaders. I've hired, managed, developed, fired many, many product managers. And over time, I'll hire someone great, and I'll say, what were the skills of that person that made them awesome? Or, uh, and, and are they reflected on my list? Or somebody that was really stinky, and what did I miss? And I've been calibrating these two lists for decades. So what I look for are technical skills. Technology is the lifeblood of what we do. Um, someone, I was talking with someone here, they, they were delighted in the fact that I'm an English major. So uh, from a technology point of view, I'm just good about not letting my eyes gloss over when my tech <laughs> partners start talking techie. Okay? Bill's laughing, that must mean he finds it true. Management, that is the systems and processes to deliver results. Most of you are engaged and in, in, in agile today. Creative work, ideas that matter, are the lifeblood of the product manager's job. And then some of these product leaders know how to del deliver shareholder value or business, the margin enhancement. Marketing, how to package and position an idea in a way that resonates with customers. That's the skill that I look for here. Design, the last 10 years, it got increasingly challenging as we tried to create very simple things on this tiny little interface, your mobile phone. And the last, and this has been a huge change in the last 10 years or so, in the old days you would do a survey to get what people said, and in the modern era you can A-B test to find out can you change customer behavior in a way that helps deliver more customer delight or shareholder value. I call that consumer insight. Uh, Suzanne's in the room, what are some sources of consumer insight? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of different kinds of research. Yeah, what kind? Other than AB, you can do qual or quant, you can do in homes. So she's a consumer insight person. <laughs> and the big dog is AB testing. So today there are hundreds, maybe even close to a thousand AB tests that are. How many are running right now at PayPal in parallel? PayPal Mafia? Let me test uh, which products? We're checking. All. Is it hundreds? Hundreds. 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 Yeah, hundreds. hundreds. Yeah, maybe a thousand. And so th this has been the major thousands. source of consumer insight, better living through math. 
So on the leadership side, I, I call anybody who becomes a VP a muckety-muck. Some people call them womp womps. Um, but the, the skills that I look for, and, and if I'm interviewing a product leader who's, who's at that level, or frankly a CFO or a head of marketing or a CEO, there's a set of leadership skills that I look for. The first is leadership, and that's can they communicate an inspired communication of, 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 of a vision? Can Steve Jobs do leadership? Okay, well, of course he can. The next, management is different on the right. So as you advance in your career, you find yourself building, you're hiring folks, you're building organizations, you're building teams, you're building companies, and even later you're helping to build industries. And this is at a high, higher level how I think about managing. The strategic thinking about what are the things that you say no to? What are the, the, the rare two or three things out of a hundred that you say yes to? That, that what is the intersection of delighting customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways? Steve Jobs was relentlessly results oriented. I'm a much kinder, gentler, even nice version of that. I've learned to care a lot about culture, which is um, I've worked with some entrepreneurial CEOs. They would sell the chairs in order to meet the salary every quarter. And that turns out to be, in the long term, a bad thing for companies when no one can sit. Right? Um, and culture, it, it, over time, it's, you know, what I love about it is getting focused on a set of values and the kind of people you hire and you fire that where people can make great decisions without a process. And process is the evil thing that sucks energy out of innovative companies. Business maturity, that's simply making good judgment about people, about the product, and about the business. Uh, and it doesn't correlate with age. <laughs> so I have noticed that Mark Zuckerberg has uncommon business maturity. He's made lots of great decisions about people and product. I have an advantage with age. I've made lots of stupid mistakes, and I simply pass on my learnings to others so they don't make the same stupid mistakes as I. Okay? So that is a somewhat small advantage of age. Last is I'm cognizant about it, the domain expertise that I'm hiring for. Neil McCartney, McCarthy, does this look familiar to you, this list? It looks familiar. Yeah, I've interviewed him a few times, right? Okay, so the question here is what are your superpowers? And I, in a bit I will reveal the, the two or three things where I think I'm special on the product side and the two or th three things where I think I'm special on the right side. I've learned to, to focus more on the things that are, where I'm quite different and unique and bring a lot of value to a company. And I, I've just learned to overlook my obvious weaknesses, like my inability to write code, for instance. Okay? So I surround myself with bright en engineers, and it's, it's working out. All right, Bill Scott, you ready for the superpower cold call? On the left side, and you, you guys, I'm a relentless cold caller, so you should be staring at this. And Okay, on the left side, what are the two to three special skills that I have? And on the right side, what are the two to three? So on the left side, Bill, what are yours? So I'd say technical, creative, and uh, that's consumer insight, right? Yeah, so Bill uh, grew up as an engineer. He's got strong technical skills, highly creative, and he's way into the consumer science, the better living through math, etc. <coughs> Neil, what were you? On the right side. Uh, on the right side. I prepared for the left. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Podwell, prepare for the right side. Neil. Management results culture. Good. Okay, Mike, what are your special skills on the right? Management strategy and culture. Good. And if you had a glaring hole on this list, on both of these lists, what would it be? An obvious weakness. Technical. Okay, do you worry about that? No. Oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here are mine. And they've changed over the years. Uh, I care a lot about building shareholder value. I, my first chapter of my career, I was a marketing person. So I, I've learned how to package position ideas in ways that resonate with consumers. I thought it was the mailroom. <laughs> well, I'll get to the mailroom later. Hey, what a, no heckling! Um, the consumer insight, the consumer science, uh, you know, I learned a lot about A-B testing, and Suzanne's one of the people who've helped me get insight through Qua, which made me kind of different and weird at Netflix. Netflix, everybody's strongly data-driven. I just had a little different take. I always had the voice of the customer in my head via Qua, which was unusual. On the right side, the leverage for me has been figuring out 
What's the strategy for a company communicating in inspired ways? That's the leadership. And you'll see later, I've built lots of teams, organizations, companies, <coughs> and even industries. The good news in all this is you don't have to develop all of these skills overnight. I certainly didn't. I'll, I'll reveal later that I sucked at most everything <laughs> early on. So I'm going to give you a sense of how you can grow these skills over time. Now this is a ladder. It took me a lot of work with Kino to make the builds happen from bottom to top. So I want you to appreciate them. So at the beginning, the question is, can you build something? And then later, can you build a success? Can you build an organization? Can you build a whole company? And then can you do this really big thing called build an industry? So I'll show you how that worked out for me. This was the first thing that I built. It's called Sega. It, it's Counting Cafe from Sesame Street. It's for the Sega Genesis. Uh, and I think 200 people enjoyed it. <laughs> and, and it cost me $1,000 per customer to, to deliver that goodness. But I learned how to build something. It's hard to copy. <laughs> it was very hard to copy. <laughs> This was my first hit. Uh, this is the year that Oprah Winfrey threw Tickle Me Elmo's into the audience on TV. And Elmo became a big hit. And I had built this, this idea that all the preschool skills that you needed for your th 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 three, four, five-year-old. So this was the big uh, top hit of, of the year in circa, God, 1997 or something crazy. To build an organization, over time, it was clear that I could build kids' software products, but, and I signed Schoolhouse Rock, and Madeline the Little French Girl, and, and Arthur, and Sesame Street, and Pokemon, and it was clear I couldn't do all the work myself, so I found myself in the process of hiring people and building an organization. And then uh, my first uh, successful build of a company was Creative Wonders, sold that to Mattel, uh, I joined Netflix, I'll, I'll show you later, to, well, I'll show you in a second, to help build an industry, and Chegg was uh, a kid's, uh, rather, a uh, textbook rental company down the street. Uh, so these are examples of, of me working to help build a successful company. <coughs> the industry, you know, I just think it's so, so way cool that today this industry of streaming exists worldwide, and that was great fun uh, and, and a neat experience, and I'm glad you're you're enjoying it, especially the ones who pay. <laughs> All right, so um, skills and stages here. At the beginning, it's basic design and management, the systems and processes to build stuff. In the case of Elmo, it was me understanding the power of marketing and consumer insight. And you know, back then, it was doing a lot of kid test, kid test, kid, te kid testing. In building an organization, I learned about the <laughs> leverage of leadership and of how important it was to have a strategy that 100 or 200 or 300 people in the company could all understand. And then I found myself a day or two a week hiring and then trying to figure out what the right company, the right culture was. And then in building the company, you learn a lot about, I call it cross-functional leadership, just a fancy word for getting inside the head of your marketing partner, your CFO partner, your technology partner, your HI partner, and the importance of an overall company strategy. And in the long term, the industry, takes a long time. So uh, in Netflix, there was a well-developed long-term strategy around that virtuous cycle of that device ecosystem. And then you learn the importance of hard uh, partnership. In that case, with all hardware manufacturers all over the world to stream stuff to TV. So I've talked about what is the job of a, of a product leader and that, that notion of delighting customers and margin enhancing hard to copy ways and the skills that you need. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the experimentation, the creativity in, in, your, in your career. And my first little news flash is careers are not linear. You don't jump on the track and just go. And I'll thank Google. If you do a search for winding path, <laughs> this is what you find. Anybody recognize this? It's the silk. <laughs> yeah. um, and actually, I noticed about two or three months ago, LinkedIn published something. Of course, LinkedIn's got the data for all of your careers and the whole world's careers. 
And what they just they looked at the career paths of CEOs and they found that the fastest path to CEO was this meandering path. And it was largely the CEOs needed to learn these different functions in order to do the cross functional leadership that was described. So and you'll see my, my career is a frickin' winding path and the one thing that I've done well is I've jumped off the tracks a lot and I've been thrown off the tracks. I've been laid off, I've been hired, I've been fired, my company has died um, and I've gotten comfortable getting off of that, that beaten path onto the, the, the meandering path. So I was so delighted when I did a search on Google for fork in the road, <laughs> they delivered this image. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I thought about my career. It was a series of choices. At the beginning, I thought startups would be cool. I was also interested in teaching. And I thought, gosh, the career of a marketing person would be a good thing for me. And I also thought, well, I'm going to be a CEO someday. And then later, and I'll take you through this, I thought being a product leader where you build stuff would be cool. And then I had to learn a lot about, was I a starter from the beginning of a startup? Or was I a builder? Was I better at coming in later? It was I interested in building bang bang shoot 'em up games, which my wife said were very very bad for the world. She's the person in our household who's trying to freaking cure cancer, and she holds me to this very high standard. I think it's unfair. Or was I going to do good for the world through education? Uh, and I'll talk a little about, about my unusual career now, which is definitely not on the beaten path. Being an executive in residence, an advisor, a teacher, a board. So this is. The, my, I took a year off from college and I started the J World Sailing School. And the main thing is I discovered I love teaching, I love creating uh, content, I love talking and, and, and helping passing on learnings. And, and it's, a, it's a neat company, it still exists. And the main thing, growing up on the East Coast, I discovered Silicon Valley early, which was just serendipity. And Dexter pointed out that my, I was afraid I was going to become a like, sailing bum, and I had to start my professional career. So I, I, I entered an ad agency to learn about marketing in the mailroom. And my wife thought I did computer stuff or something. And no, I pushed around a mail cart and delivered mail. She discovered that like five years ago. Uh, at some point, I was, I was a marketing leader in the Bay Area, and I wanted to get engaged in Silicon Valley tech. I happened to go back to business school to know me as I, I, any business school that has its own ski hill is freaking awesome. Um, so this is a picture of me circa 1991. This is Kristen, my then girlfriend, now wife, and, and these styles are coming back, damn it. <laughs> my second year of business school, at two in the morning when I was done with my cases, I would use HyperCard. Does anyone know what HyperCard is? Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> So I was prototyping kid games from 2 to 3 in the morning. And I just thought it was the coolest, neatest thing. And what I did was I sent one of these prototypes to Trip Hawkins, who was the CEO of Electronic Arts, Sir Crook, uh, 1991. Back then, he would leave a message on my, my answering machine. And I came home, hit the button in my dorm room, and there was a message from Trip saying, Give, that was the second weirdest resume anyone's ever sent to me. And a day later, I called him back and said, whose was the weirdest? <laughs> he said, that would be Bing Gordon. He runs marketing for me. So this is how I got a job initially in, in marketing at Electronic Arts. And then I had a theory. You know, I was like director level. And I jumped in and became an assistant producer at Electronic Arts. My theory was I'd really love to build stuff. And I did. So I signed this long-term exclusive with Sesame Street. Anybody recognize this dude? Somebody's laughing. Kevin O'Leary of Shark Tank. You watch him on the airplane, right? With Chris Saka, too. It's kind of cool. Uh, so we sold the company to him, and the way he made his $3.5 billion, he sold the learning company to Mattel. So good for him. Uh, and this is Mattel. Um, note carefully the pixelated logo. Okay? If you see that in a presentation, you know that this company died. <laughs> So Family Wonder was the place that it was one of the first e-commerce companies modeled after eToys you went to, to to buy stuff or to figure out fun things to do with your family. I've given this presentation a couple times and everybody wants to hear about more failure. So I, I've added in a few failure slides. Um, look carefully at my LinkedIn profile. 
you'll notice uh, 2001, that was a, 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 we sold a company to Sega. Uh, and then look at, look at what I did for like two years. I, I was a consultant. I had two projects in two or three years, okay? That's what it looks like when somebody freaking dives off the tracks. And I um, didn't answer phone calls. I was a great dad. I did math builders at, and helped kids at the elementary school. I, I cooked my one chicken dinner most of the days a week for the family, um, and it was kind of wild and scary. I think, John, you were a reference for me at Netflix, right? Three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so what did he ask you? He asked, why has this guy taken five years off? <laughs> Does he really want to go back to work? Yeah. And John covered to... for me. Said he was a good dad. Yeah, good dad. Um, so anyways, the, the, my path, I, I've screwed up a bunch of times, and then I just sort of doggedly go back. This is a, do you think this thing worked? <laughs> this, is a, this is a neuro performance startup. If you had dyslexia, this might help you. Uh, Keith Raboy was the COO. I was quite impressed by him. Peter Thiel at the time was impressive. Uh, and then I got in there and I realized the data was um, oversold. It's a nice way of saying it. Uh, and then good outcome. Thank you to John's reference where I landed at Netflix. This is my wonderfully personalized homepage today. You can tell I'm into boys, bang, bang, shoot them up, action, adventure. Uh, after uh, Netflix, again, I've got the pitter-patter of my wife saying, what are you really doing, Gibbs? So I went to Chegg, where we helped. Today, Chegg saves $600 million a year for students who can rent versus buy. Am I in order of magnitude correct? We've got some Cheggsters here. Um, and this is me at the IPO. I never helped take a company. I, my, my daughters give me grief because I, I still don't own a suit, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I, I'll just give you a little newsflash. I wasn't particularly happy at that moment in time, and I'll, I'll describe why a little bit later. And, and I've been experimenting, so I, I work as an EIR product for NerdWallet. It's a way cool fintech company up in the city. EIR means that I, I, I only work three days a week, uh, so it's cool. And then uh, some of the Stanford classes, uh, how many folks are, took, took a Stanford class with me? Yeah, see, they proudly raised their hands. They just did their final presentation to a dozen VCs. It was, it was way cool. Um, so now I'll look back at these theories and hypotheses. Um, I put in bold the stuff that I learned works for me. So I love teaching. Initially, I got engaged as a market leader. I, I, I decided I was never going to be a CEO, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. I love being a product builder, but I learned that, I, that I'm not the right person to start from scratch. So I tend to come into a startup when there's a proof of concept and it's ready to scale. So that might be 20 or 40 or 50 or, but God knows, 100 people. Um, the entertainment versus education, a really hard problem for me. On one hand, you can make money in entertainment. You can make money rotting people's brains out watching way too much TV in entertainment. And in education, you can do for the good for the world, and you can't quite make as much money. That's what I found. So I tend to go back and forth between the two. I've loved being an EIR, an advisor, a teacher. And my failed hypotheses are all in white. So I, I'm, I would be a really suck EVC. It took me a little bit to come to that conclusion. Or I'd be a nominal board member. So what I did for you uh, as a career hacker, the, the critical thing is to, what's the right metric? So I'm going to throw three metrics that I've applied in my career. This is what income looks like. You'll see at the bottom left that being in a mailroom doesn't pay very well. Okay? <laughs> And then you see, you know, when I went to school, it's all money out the door, and then the growth as I grew up as a leader, and then there's the, the cavern of death um, <laughs> down in there. But notice, you know, most people say it's, it's not good to leave a job to find a job. So I left a job. You can see, right after Family Wonder, I, I went into... I, I, I was a great triathlete. <laughs> Um, but then when I came back to work, it was like my income had, had gone up in this linear way. I didn't even go into the penalty box. Like, that's wild. Grow up with Netflix, income goes up, and then try to I start the next thing, income goes up. And you can tell, you know, I'm making half of what I would do. That's fair enough, as I only 
really work three days a week. <laughs> but is this right? Is this right the type of way to think about what your metric should be for what's the right career? So I'm going to give you a couple others. So I want you all to, to, to form in your head a number from zero to ten. And this is about what is my current job satisfaction where zero sucks and ten is totally awesome. So just pick a number in your head and I want you to think about it. And I'll, I might cold call someone a little later. How are you doing, Mike Podwell? <laughs> I don't want it yet, but it seems like you'd be willing to give it to me. <laughs> um, so here's mine. Remember that moment I had taken Shag Public? And my sad is like down at a five. Like most people think taking a comp company public is awesome. You know, my challenge is I had sort of really loved being in this high-paced industry. It, the, the industry was changing, and education, it just moved so slowly, I felt like I was pounding my head against a wall. So that sort of ultimately led to my, my five on a ten-point scale. And you can see I'm doing pretty well now, right? And then the Netflix thing, you know, what happened was I, I'm awesome at joining a startup and helping it to grow, and then at some point, I don't have the right skills to take it to the next level. Um, and, but but I, I excel at, at helping a startup with the proof of concept to grow. So you can see my SAT going up and down. So I did another one. Is the work that you're doing good for the world? Look at that. I'm building kids software to help kids learn their <coughs> math and writing skills. That's awesome. And I'm fundamentally rotting people's brains out at Netflix watching way too much TV, okay? And then I'm helping students save like 700 million a year renting instead of buying textbooks. Three different metrics. Like, which one are you going to optimize for? So I'm going to show you what works for me. The, the metric that has helped me the most is that number. So every time I find myself below an eight, I've got to do one of two things. I've got to figure out how to recraft my job to make my satisfaction higher, or I got to jump off the tracks and try something different. And that has been incredibly helpful for me. The 2 a.m. test. So remember my second year of business school, I'm prototyping kids' games. Like, if you're doing something at 2 in the morning and it's not watching TV, it might be an insight about what you want to do when you grow up. Okay? There's some other things that you can't make money doing at 2 in the morning. <laughs> the other thing is uh, I, I learned to be relatively unafraid. Like most of us investors understand this concept of you got to get reward, you got to take on risk. But we kind of clamp up in applying that to our own thinking. Um, so, you know, a lot of times this was easy for me. I just got frickin' thrown off the tracks. Like, the, the, the company that I was at, we ran out of funding, game over. Uh, but the neat thing about that is I got really, really good at job hunting, okay? And if you're really, really good at job hunting, if you are aggressive in networking all the time, hence not just when you need the help, if you're good at diving into industry and getting to know the five or ten companies that are awesome quickly and easily, uh, if you can learn to interview well, because you interview a lot, these are things that make you unafraid. I mentioned my wife, she's a, a biotech leader. We're a two-career household, which is awesome. So she jumps off the tracks and does some way cool thing. I'm paying the mortgage and vice versa. And then we doubled down, like we knew to invest in college, good investment. We knew to invest in med school and business school, good investment. And then we invested in nanny which is probably our best investment. <laughs> she still works for us, despite the fact that our kids have left the house. <laughs> the other thing is, I'm, I'm really good at sucking at stuff. So I've learned, like I love skiing, I've learned four different <laughs> snow sports. I just love the beginning part of learning. And I have this sort of beginner's mindset model. And in, in all of these things, when I was learning, 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 growing, taking on mastery, had a great boss, company was growing, those were the things that pushed my job sat up to 9 and 10, and then it would start falling up when I was stopping to learn. I wasn't as excited about it, and that's when I would jump ship. The other thing, like in the last week, I've done five different sort of career talks. Is this true, Zhang? You were one of them. 
And I, and I finally, like, oh, shoot, I'm doing five of these. Like, why are people asking me? And they started to say, Gib, you're very thoughtful and disciplined in your approach to making decisions around these things. And Bill's nodding his head. Uh, um, but th this idea of forming a series of hypotheses and training your career as an experiment has been super helpful to me. All right, so I'm going to help you to extend. Okay? If you brought me a pummel horse, I would have done some stuff for you. Okay? <laughs> So these are, I have a bigger personal board of directors than this, and I'm going to talk about some of the insights that the, each of them has given to me. How many feel that you have a board of directors today? Okay, so Mike, what's up? I'm questioning whether I do, I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll get back to you. Phil, you have a personal board of directors? You know, I, I, I got an email from somebody we both know saying, Dear Personal Board of Directors, to me. I'm like, oh, I love you. Um, okay, so uh, Greg Bestick was my uh, first boss when I was a product leader at the kids' software company, Creative Wonders. It was very hard to find a photo of him. <laughs> uh, he, he, he values his privacy. But it was he that said, hey, Gib, you're a product leader. You're running product for the first time. You really don't know what you're doing. Go out and build your community of peers because they're going through all the same issues as you at the same time. And it was super helpful advice. This is Ron Hogue. I went to Little Amherst College, uh, little private New England colleges. If you ask someone for help, they will give you help because there's not that many classmates. He's a generation ahead. He, you know, he and I talked, I had had a bunch of successful little startups. And he said, Gib, I don't know how much you learn from each startup whether you just had good luck or you were fundamentally learning about building shareholder and customer value, why don't you, and you also talk about frickin' building an industry that takes like 15 or 20 years. So why don't you look around and find a, a good company and help to make it great? And that was Netflix, where I, I learned a ton. It was great advice from him. This is Irv Grosbeck. He was the do dollar a year professor of entrepreneurship. This guy invented the cable TV industry. He also went to Amherst. And, uh, this is, I love, Irv. Gib, can I tell you something you may not like? Okay. You're too nice to be a startup CEO. He saved me about five years of pounding my head against the wall and doing a job, which I agree with him, I would suck at. Okay? Super helpful advice, saving me five years. Patty McCord, our HR partner at Netflix. Uh, most of her quotes, I can't share in public. <laughs> uh, but, you know, one of them is just, just keep getting better. So, you know, it's always upgrading my team. Today, she's, she's like, she's totally in my corner. Do not go back and work full time. Like, your career hacking looks totally awesome. Okay? So, I, you know, of course, I'm keeping her on my team. Uh, Joel Jewett, he also went to Amherst College. He retired at age 40. And he was a drummer. He would deliver the kids to school. He would come back and drum in his garage. He'd work out. He'd pick up the kids at school. And after a year, his family did an intervention with him. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, you have to go back to work. And it was he who said, hey, Gib, uh, you can't stop working. You need to find something that will fulfill both your social needs and your purpose. So I'm nominally part of NerdWallet. My purpose is largely about teaching, coaching, and mentoring. Super helpful advice when he was sharing his mistakes. Langley Steiner was a classmate at Tuck. He started TripAdvisor. He's now got a way cool company called CarGurus. Um, he's like, Gib, get into vertical search. He's been telling me that for 15 years. NerdWallet is a fintech company that's essentially in, in um, vertical search. You know, he's, he's consistently been helpful to me in picking companies. So he thinks like a VC. Remember that example I gave of the, this neuroperformance company? That's when I started talking more with VCs because I realized that my joining a company was an investment in my own time the way VCs invest their money. And that's when I actively built out my network to include some really bright financial types. Uh, Bill Campbell died this year, which is total bummer. Um, great role model. Uh, but he also helped me quite a bit. Um, said, hey, Gib, you hate the filtered truth. So you would hate being on the board of a company. 
Uh, and that was a great insight. So I, I'm I'm observer and advisor, and I get to dig in the dirt and find out what's really going on, which as a board member you rarely get to see. The other thing I learned with Bill is this really um, weird thing about who's helping whom. <laughs> Um, so Bill was super helpful to me, but then at some point he would call me over and say, hey, I've got the CEO that I'm struggling with, what would you do? Um, and I realized that he, he valued me, which is important when I start thinking about the, the, the relationship of peers and mentors. So I, I have both um, in, in my board. The peers, they're in a similar function and stage and company. Uh, Bill, you would be a great example of a peer. He's doing work similar to me at PayPal. He, in fact, is a past colleague, so I've been very good about keeping up with all the colleagues from past companies, and we provide mutual support. I'm, I'm, I don't know if I've ever helped you, Bill, but you've helped me. <laughs> you just help me by being around. Oh, thank you, thank you. That and the good trash, right? Okay, uh, my mentors, I've learned they have extraordinary judgment, just like Barry uh, McCarthy is one of my VC pals who helps me pick companies. They have broad skills and network. They're trustworthy. I share my secrets. And then, in the case of Irv Grofbeck, they're, they're both candid with me, but I can tell it's delivered in the right way. They care about me. But they delivered the unfiltered truth, no matter the pain. Uh, and this is what I have learned to, to really value. Now, folks ask, you know, how the hell do you find a mentor? Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you this from two directions. Uh, in the case of Bill Campbell, uh, Renee is his niece. Where she was the receptionist at Chad, and she was also my fantasy football coach. She was expert in it. And then I, I didn't know that she was related to Bill, but over time um, we would show up and have beers together um, at the, the old pro in Palo Alto. But that's an example of taking a weak length and strengthening it a bit. There's a personality fit. So now I'm going to move on. This is John Liu. He's somewhere in his 20s, maybe 25. Uh, he started coming to me as a nerd wallet. I just liked the guy. We, we, we got along. And then I started throwing some tests at him. Hey, John, I need you to set up a meeting four weeks from now. Like, it's not a hard test, but he actually did it. And then I started asking him, like, you need to do some stuff for me. Like, this is not just about you, this is about me. And uh, he, I'll tell you what he did for me, which is, hey, he was really interested in product, he's in data. I said, you need to find a side project. You know, something you do at 2 in the morning or on your weekend. And he said, do you have any side projects? I said, no. I said, so at some point, I finally said, yeah, I got a side project for you. I need you to build me a website, www.gibsonbiddle.com, that talks about these talks. And this was on a Friday. He said, I can't do that. I said, sure you can. Um, so on, on Monday, he built me a, a little website, which is way cool. Um, but this is an example of a, it's using Squarespace, which I knew he could figure out. Um, but this, this is an example where a mentee created real value for me. I had a friend, uh, Michael Sparks in the East Coast. I asked him to go to every meetup in New York City and tell me what the biggest and the best ones were. And three weeks later, he sent me back the, the phone numbers, the contacts, and set me up at one of them. So these are examples of how you work to build a relationship with a potential mentor. And the, the key on the, the board in the extending your career is most people make the mistake of only reaching out to the board when they are in trouble. Okay? And as a mentor, that sucks. Okay? So I, I, on the other side of it, I keep up with my board members. I do these little tiny updates. This is what I'm doing. And, and then when I do the whole, holy moly, I got a problem, they, they, it, it doesn't feel so out of the blue. Uh, encourage candor. I, you know, I can play back the feedback I've gotten from my board over the years because I listen carefully and I remember. And then the other thing about your boards is you got to refresh and upgrade pretty often. So uh, in my case, a lot of them have retired, uh, and I, I'm always looking for um, more current, more relevant folks code for younger. <laughs> so I want to, um, I want you to think about your number. That number from zero to <coughs> ten. And if your number is less than eight, you have some thinking to do. 
and, and I want you to reflect on, you know, why aren't you being braver in your career? Last night, uh, about two weeks ago, John Dawes and I saw a talk by Mike Maples, who said, life is short, you should only engage in legendary things. <laughs> and like, you know, all of us were like totally terrified, right? <laughs> um, but the point was important, which is if you find yourself in that place where your job set is a three, four, five, or six, you know, you either got to really fundamentally figure out how to rework it or try something different. You've got to be a little bit bolder. Try to find a way to experiment and take on this risk. Now, it doesn't have to be quitting. It could be find the side job, do something other than binge watching, Netflix, Saturday, you know, engage in these experiments. Uh, and so, bringing it home, what I'd like you to think about and to do... Oh, what was your number, Mike? It's a personal question. Okay, okay, okay. it's fine. It is a personal question. Um, <laughs> yeah, just tweet it. Um, so, take action. So, define and build your superpowers. Hack these hypotheses. Over the next five or ten years, what are the theories and hypotheses, the tangents, the direction that I want to take my career on? Build that board. And this is, newsflash, a freaking awesome place to begin to build that community of peers or of mentors or of mentees. Uh, and people, so with that, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. And thank you very much for being here. have two mics, but the battery on the other mic is not, that one's dead, Dimitri, so we're going to use one. The way this works is you have to raise your hand, and one of our mic runners will give you the mic, so that in talking to the mic, so everybody else can hear your question, okay? So if you have a question for Gib, it's awesome talk you gave us, then raise your hand. No questions, you nailed it, dude. Nailed the, <laughs> nailed the pummel horse. All right. I'll remember you. I'm good on the mic, probably. You must use the mic. <laughs> Bonus points for questions from Stanford students. We have not submitted the grades as yet. Yeah, how can I help you? I was going to ask if you have any advice for current business school students. Oh, I just, I, I, I just think you're in an amazing place. So you're going to graduate this spring? No, I'm following. Oh, you're even in a more amazing place. <laughs> um, so the, the key is spend time about what you want to do this summer. Uh, and it's only going to be eight or ten weeks, which means you can take on quite a bit of risk. Okay? Um, and find out if you like it. And if you like it, you're setting yourself up for the year following where you've demonstrated your passion in that area. It's also an awesome time for making pretty big career changes. So I, I was the marketing guy who went into startup and tech. And, and the, the main reason is I had spent my summer at IBM in competitive intelligence wearing my pink shirt. Uh, and, and most of my friends know exactly what I was doing. I was doing research on what company I wanted to work the year after in Silicon Valley. And that included Electronic Arts, Bruder Bunn, Learning Company, Apple, etc. Um, so I just think you're in this awesome, I mean, the hard thing is deciding whether or not you want to go to business school. You've already decided that. I'm assuming you're enjoying it. So it's a great time to experiment with this next summer. Uh, so I, I had a great experience. Uh, and I still, don't, still think it's relevant and helpful. All right, next. Do your board of directors know each other? Yeah, 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 kind of, sort of. Um, from time to time, um, I have brought two or three together at the same time. Um, sometimes it feels more social. Um, but it, it's, from time to time, it is helpful to have multiple springboards in the same place at the same time. And I think the key thing is they all know me quite well. Um, and if there are trusted relationships, I can bring you know, multiple folks together. Frankly, it's just a huge scheduling nightmare. Um, but I, in the case of last week, I, I, I noticed that it was a to me, uh, but this person had shared it with two other folks. It said, dear personal board of directors. That's really good sucking up. That got my attention. Um, and and I, I knew the other two people. So that was kind of fun. And then in that conversation, I asked him, what did the other one say? Uh, so it was fun. 
Yes. Yes, to... you. Do I need Sarah. the mic? Huh? I'll repeat the question for you. So, thank you for the talk. You're welcome for the talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love the Silicon Valley. I've been here, but I'm probably going to pursue a career that's more international. Do you have any advice for me? You're graduating now? Uh, so the question is, uh, I love Silicon Valley, but I'm interested in a career that's more international. Do I have any advice? Get all where, your shots. Where do you, where, where, yeah, oh, yeah. get all your shots. Okay, thank you, next question. Um, <laughs> where do you want to work? Probably Sweden. Probably Sweden. Okay, you know, you're so much smarter about international than I. I'm just an American. Um, <laughs> Connected with Rochelle to go to Spotify. There you go. Uh, very helpful. Yeah, Rochelle. So Rochelle, Rochelle King is running product and design for Spotify. She's now in New York, but they've got a substantial yeah, can, team in Stockholm. And Bill will connect you. Okay. Is that good enough? <laughs> yeah. She wants an offer. <laughs> I get a cut. Yes. So you listed your personal board of directors as about six people. Would you say that you have different boards of directors for different projects you work on, or just a static group that applies to all? Uh, they evolve pretty quickly. So some like like Dan Olson, where is he? He went to the bathroom. Um, he's doing a lot of things that I'm keenly interested in, which is one of the reasons I connected with him. Um, so it changes over time. Uh, in, in the case of Dan, I wanted to learn about what's, what's, what's it like doing talks, what's it like writing a book, like it sucks, um, and uh, you know, what, what does it take to be an effective speaker, etc. So I, I consciously in the last two years was interested in learning about new things, and that meant I needed to change um, you know, what my board of directors look like. So it's pretty, it changes pretty often. Uh, but there have been some consistent features, like John Chinkuti is one of my, you know, he's been with me 10 years, and I've been with him 10 years. Um, so it, it changes over time as you develop new interests. Way back on the question, uh, with the awesome. mic. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome advice, thanks for the talk. Uh, so does any of your uh, points change for a career transition to a business to business world? Like, I'm an engineer transitioning to a product management in a B2B company. Yeah. So any any advice yeah. in a B2B transition? Yeah, so I, I have been <coughs> maniacally focused on uh, building consumer stuff, which I love. Um, John Dawes is a pal here. He's he's the mirror image of me. He grew up as an engineer and is in enterprise software. Um, yeah, well, a lot of the advice is the same. is build that community of peers because they're going to be much smarter than I. Uh, same on the board. The thing that I have found interesting and complex about enterprise software is you have the end user and you also have the person that you're selling to. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be challenging and interesting. Um, and I have chosen not to engage in enterprise software. The other reason is John's a good example. At times he was the head of marketing, but he, he can write code. He, he was a CS major at Stanford, etc. It requires more technical chops to, to be a successful product manager and enterprise, to my thinking. And I was light, you know, the English major, where I could get away with it, consumer. John, would you add anything else to the list or things to think about for enterprise? It's more the same than different. John's, John, what he said is actually the jobs are more the same than they are different, which makes me hopeful. <laughs> Uh, just a few months back, Rich Marinoff gave an excellent talk that you should go review. It was at this meetup. It was on product management for enterprise. He had all kinds of great points on that, so go review that. Cool. Yes. So uh, one of the things that resonated with me was uh, talking about staying brave, um, but you also talked a lot about getting thrown from the tracks and forks in the road. So what are the qualities that you have found that help you stay brave during those times? It's like entrepreneurship. It's uh, optimistic, being optimism, being resilient, uh, and dusting yourself off and trying again. So uh, it's, it feels very much like entrepreneurship, but just for yourself. Uh, and there's been, you know, there's been, you know, a year or so where my wife would worry about me and then there's been years she's like I don't know how the heck you're doing that but it looks like a lot of fun um, and it's good to be married and have that 
person you can consistently bank on. So it's good to be me. <laughs> yes. Uh, so product management is the hot the hot thing in Silicon Valley. Product management is about saying no. So how do you know when you should say no to doing product management? Yeah. Okay. Wow. So the uh, product management is the hot thing in Silicon Valley. Product management is all about saying no. Uh, how do you know what to say no to? So. I don't know if you noticed, but I, I don't really even like to say product management. I think of it as product leadership. And that is the real key thing to the job. And the most important component of product leadership is setting the strategy. Uh, and so in all of my jobs, I can articulate the, the three to five strategies that are important, uh, that define the, the two or three things out of 100 we will say yes to. I'm also good about defining the metrics, the way that we will measure our success against those key strategies. And then there's a bunch of projects or tactics that I just think of as experiments against those strategies. And so if, if you can define via strategy the five to ten things that you think are really important, it makes saying no to the other stuff much easier. People don't even propose it because they know it is off strategy. So that's the way. Hey, most people don't like to be told not what not to do. Um, so I try to give a lot of direction about what are the key principles. I did it with Netflix. It was all about personalization, instant, the margin enhancing, making things easy, the virtuous cycle. Those were all critical things. Uh, but at the end of the day, more than half of our experiments were failures. Um, and that's the dust yourself up. And then some of our hypotheses were total freaking idiot things. Did anybody use friends at Netflix? I built yeah, it. about three or four. <laughs> that was like three years of effort. Okay, it failed. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> okay, you've got the mic. What was your biggest challenge that you faced in your PM career, and how did you um, tackle it? <laughs> uh, the question is, what's your biggest failure as a PM, and how did you tackle it? Um. Challenges. No, 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 yeah. I'm trying to think of the right one. That's an interview. Uh, you know, the, I guess the hardest part for me was early on in my career, I had to do so much learning by doing without any real capable help. And that was really hard. And that's when my boss gave me the insight to, to reach out and build my network of peers, because his insight was, they're probably going through the same issues as you. He also knew that he couldn't help me. Um, but there were about you know, five years where I was keenly aware of my, my process, was wickedly inefficient. Um, and then later, I, I just learned how to engage more help from my community of peers, the mentors, et cetera. It made it harder. Uh, it's like when you, like, if you engage in entrepreneurship, uh, you know, at some point you have one month of money in the bank, and then two weeks, and then it's game over. <laughs> uh, that was always hard. Um, but half the time the funding showed up, you know, and we needed the next round two weeks to go. That was hard. I had to encourage my wife not to talk about our funding status, because hmm. we often we would get it at the last moment, minute. Harry's got the, the guy with the microphone. Okay, yeah. who's got the mic? Hi. Uh, based on your experience, I'm going to make an assumption. I mean, the assumption was, or is, that you've been involved in the ground floor, directly involved with setting direction, and as, as things take off, get successful, other people's people come in and start making decisions and such based on what you've built. So my question to you is, assuming that's happened to you, does that give you energy, or did you struggle with that when that happened? Gave me energy. So I, you know, I sort of alluded to it. I have high social needs, so uh, more people is better for me. And then over time, I was very comfortable of letting go uh, and recognizing that my job was to set other people up. I call them multiple swimming lanes, uh, multiple projects to to be successful, to set their own strategy in their area, their own metrics, their tactics, or projects. And, and develop a high cadence. And then you can tell part of my motivation is just teaching folks. So I was delighted when more folks came in and did more work and had more success. 
Um, so it was, it was incredibly energizing for me. I, I never had problems letting go. I was happily doing it. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, so in the graph that you shared... Ah, thank you. Yes. Um, in the graph that you shared with the different metrics, um, were you able to discern any kind of correlation between the dips and any of the things that you weren't, like across the product and the leader list, any of the things that were your weaknesses? Yeah, there are a couple things. Um, when I looked at my charts and graphs after the fact, I did realize that my job sat would peak and then begin to head south when I didn't feel I was learning as much. Um, another case was at Netflix where I wasn't going to be the right guy to get the company to the next level. What they needed was essentially a consumer scientist, uh, an incredibly data-driven person. <coughs> And that wasn't me. Um, so I can remember that when I looked at my charts and graphs. I was really asking the question, why did my SAT uh, start dipping? There are a few examples of bosses I wasn't crazy about in, in that um, there's a couple of pockets of people that know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, so I noticed that sort of. Uh, uncomfortable relationship with my boss, not learning and growing as fast as I wanted. And then some other things would happen in your life. You know, like, uh, like I was at a startup and I had kids and I'd walk Kelsey into Creative Wonders on the weekend and I just had to change my style. Um, so I couldn't do the work, but everybody in the building knew that I had Kelsey and they also knew that I knew that they were working their butts off on the weekends. So there's lots of different things that happen in your life over time. Way in the back. What if you're a product leader and you're not able to make that long-term strategy because that's reserved for senior executive leadership? What do you at the ground level do to influence at the top? Uh, so the question is, you're a punk kid in an organization. You don't really feel like you can set the strategy. I, you know, I have a high degree of ownership, so I... My, like, I gave you the example of Sesame Street. I didn't know what I was doing, uh, but I worked hard, I was smart, and I was freaking determined. Um, and so I developed my mastery around Sesame Street. Um, and over time, you know, I just feel like there's a meritocracy at work. Uh, they actually kept hiring a boss for me, which I loved. I, like, I, I, I knew that I needed a boss to help me to learn and to grow. And none of them worked out. And at some point, they said, okay, we'll give, give a try, as long as he dresses better. <clears throat> okay? um, but I, I just, you know, I think you want to own your area. I, I think you want to be really smart about what your strategy is and what your metrics and tactics are. Set it, and then deliver the results. And then I'm very hopeful and optimistic that we'll be recognized. And over time, you'll eventually become a muckety-muck, if that's what you want to be. Hey, give, I have the mic. Ask who has the mic. We have to ask who has the mic. Okay. okay. Who's got the mic? Got a question? Raise your hand. Got you have the talking yes. stick. Yes. Um, so I've been in product leadership for a few years and uh, recently ended my last gig. And I'm taking a few months of a break, I think, and uh, just exploring, you know, industries. I did reach out to you and you were kind enough to talk to me. But with all of these metrics and frameworks that you have and all the crazy stuff you've done in life, um, I'm curious if you have some sort of a formula. You know, like, what's a good break for me to take, you know, to do something meaningful? And uh, before I take my next, you know, I still think I want to be in product leadership and to, before I take that next position, uh, because I think it's going to be insanely useful for me to take a break and refresh and do all of that. Um, so what's a good time uh, for that? And if you were me, you know, what, given that you don't know too much about my motivations perhaps, what are some great things to do in a shorter frame of time? Sure. So um, the first 12 years of my career, I would get the startup to a certain level, leave on a Friday, and start at the new one on a Monday. So I was totally heads down. And it was after we sold Family Wonder to Sega of Japan that I committed to taking one year off. 
and I just picked that out of the blue. My wife had given me the long list of things that she expected me to accomplish, the sort of life maintenance list. And then I got to the end of the year and I started looking around and I, I had sort of a career coach and I was struggling. And she looked at me and said, Gib, I'm not sure you're ready to go back to work. I'm like, you're right. And I was out of there. Um, so you, you sort of have to feel it. Um, and um, typically when I take a break, uh, I give myself six to 12 months to find that something that I'm really excited about. Uh, sometimes it's been three or six months, sometimes it's at the end of the ski season that I'm ready to go back to work. So it's just a, a personal thing. Um, I have been experimenting, you know, a year ago I said I was going to uh, build talks and learn to do stuff like this. I said I was going to try to figure out how to be an effective advisor. And I said I was going to host uh, a product leadership um, retreat. Uh, and, and I sort of set out at the beginning of the year, that's what I want to do, and I was very conscious, and I, I did those things. Um, so those are ways of, you know, what, what are the experiments you want to do with your free time? Um, so just be a little bit thoughtful about what am I trying to learn over the next three or six months. If it's not, get the next job. Uh, and I, I just, I loved having free time. Like FinTech, I, I started deep diving into that. It's way cool. Um, I see the PayPal folks nodding in agreement behind you. <laughs> Anyways, that, it, it's very personal, I think is the short answer. Yes, how can I help you? You have the mic, that's cool. You wrestled it. So my question is, uh, if you have any other advice regarding mentor-mentee relationship, uh, how can I add value to my mentors? Because basically mm -hmm. I feel very uncomfortable to ask for their time over and over again. Um, so that's basically my challenge. Hmm. Yeah, okay, well, the first thing is you don't get what you don't ask for, <laughs> so try. And um, the thing that I've learned, I've learned this in being an advisor, and I've learned it being on both sides of the mentor-mentee, there's a lot of personal chemistry and fit that's at work. And that's just spend time, don't even say that you want to be, you know, mentored by them. Just, like, people love to talk about themselves, say, I want to buy you lunch and I want to talk about you, Okay. Um, and then just see if there's chemistry and if you see if you enjoy talking about things. Or, you know, maybe you're way into drones like that other person. Um, so I, in that case... Who is it? Yeah, who's not into drones? You never start a drone company at Stanford, though. Um, anyways, uh, I think in the first meeting or two, you want to see if there's a personal connection, if you enjoy spending time with each other. That's the first thing. Uh, that I think is helpful. Yes, you have the stick. Good. Got it. Um, not to focus on the failures too much, but with Family Wonder, what were the hypotheses you set out with and what didn't go according to plan? Okay, so uh, Family Wonder was wild. Uh, this is the whole focus versus diversity. So it, it was a success. Uh, it, we, that was the company that we sold to Kevin O'Leary and it became part of the learning company, and then we sold that to Mattel. But it was wild because the company, there were three theories at work at the beginning. One was branded kids software, that theory worked. Another one was digital photography. And we were only about 10 or 15 years too early. Okay? And then another, we built something called, the, it was called infotainment, 3D Atlas, which is really what you see in Google Maps today, or Google Earth. Um, so we had three hypotheses, and once the kids' brand and software started taking off, we just went rolling with it. And of course, that was the work that I did, so it was good for me. Um, the failures, like the, um, the, the one that failed was, um, that was Creative Wonders that I just described, forgive me. Family Wonder was the, the, the hypothesis was a specialty <coughs> retailer for kids and families, like eToys. And when eToys went bankrupt, that was a very bad thing for us. Those were the early days of the internet. We were building all the tools and systems to do the work that you guys take for granted today. Uh, I, I liked it. I, you know, I got into the internet and I started learning the hard way. So I don't, and in fact, we, we, we got our investors' money back and it afforded me a, a two-year gap, which I liked. Uh, but, but you're correct, each of those startups had some fundamental theories and hypotheses at the beginning that we were testing to see if we could build a company around it. All right, we'll take two more questions. Two more Here's questions. Gonna be around. I get to drink a beer in a minute. Exactly. Very excited. <laughs> okay. 
So you talk about culture and how important it is for leadership. Have you been in a position where you influence the company's culture so it's more maybe product focused? And do you think it made a difference? My, my best experience with culture was, uh, Bill was with me on this. Um, how many of you read the Netflix culture deck? Okay. Um, Patty McCord gets a ton of credit for it and she deserves it. Um, that was a freaking editing process for two or three years. So every quarter we would get together all of the muckety mucks, the directors and up, and we would talk about what were the things that we valued in the people at the company. Um, and there's about nine principles, I think, when I looked at it today. Um, we felt, all of us together, very influential um, in that process. And there wasn't a talk about product-oriented or not. We were generally trying to figure out how to build a culture focused on innovation and risk-taking and celebrating learning and success, and even failure. Uh, and I think we all loved it. Um, and then when, when it got published, people thought I had made a mistake publishing it to the website. Um, but that was our first shot at being more transparent, and it was really fun to share with the world. Um, Amazon, lots of experiments around what does an innovative culture look like. A very different articulation and a different company. But at the end of the day, I think everybody in this room has a pretty strong hand in defining the company that they work at. Uh, it's really about uh, what are the values that you embody to help your company be great and deliver both that shareholder and the consumer value. And I, I love it. Uh, I learned about the value of culture that people can make great decisions without process or talking to each other in the early days at Electronic Arts. And I can still play back the, the, the values of that company. This is like... 25 years ago. Okay, this is the last question. Who's got the talking stick? Yeah, uh, this is more. Uh, can I just add a couple of comments to your uh, sure. thing on the mentoring? Um, you asked the question, what can you do for the mentor? Sometimes you can offer them an interesting article or a connection or some lead or something, but the main thing a mentor gets out of it is the joy of seeing you grow. And I can tell you that one of the most frustrating things for a mentor is when you don't need good advice that they give you mm -hmm. and you keep making the same mistakes again. So take it to heart what they offer you and give them some joy in watching you make it into something great. Yep. All right, we have one last question. Who wants the question? No pressure. No pressure. All right, saw your hand first. Okay. Here you go. Did you already ask one? No. All right, here you go. Yep. So um, I had a question around um, your first definition, right, where you said, a product management, product manager is somebody who loves to build um, and um, in a margin enhancing way, right? So from a strategy point of view, I think there's a very famous quote by Jeff Bezos, your margin is my opportunity. So when, like when you look at the strategy, at what point is it okay to kind of not just, or kind of give less weightage to margin um, when you're thinking about your company strategy uh, especially with respect to new industries? Yeah, so I work with lots of startups. I mean, the, the simple model that I'm used to seeing is the growth, engagement, and monetization model uh, that spells GEM, which is the reason I can remember it. Uh, that one, it really depends. Um, so right now, NerdWallet, uh, prioritizes growth, but they're, they've got a high level of monetization already in profit, and they're just beginning to focus on the engagement and ongoing retention. So that's, I, I think the key thing is in whatever company or product you're in, to do a forced ranking of those three things and make sure everyone agrees. Because it's a nasty situation when some people think growth is most important and other th folk think that the monetization is more important. Mm -hmm. But that question very much depends on the company and its stage. All right, with that, I'm going to bring it home. There's something that's super important to me, which is um, I have my own metrics. So Dan has already sent you uh, some sort of communication. It's got a SurveyMonkey link. 
and I'm freakish, so I know my net promoter score for every talk I've done the last <laughs> year or two. Um, and it's simple, zero sucks, and 10 is awesome, you can pick any number in there. And then what was good and what could be better? That feedback is amazingly helpful to me. So I, I, I've built whole new talks based on one person's comment about what they seek. Um, so click the button, and I've also included a PDF of the talk, everything that you saw here. Uh, and you can reread it and do it. You can stomp on it and burn it in the fire, whatever you would like to do. So with that, I thank you very much, and I, I will be here for a while, and I'm happy to chat. And I'm looking forward to it here. So, um, thank you so much, Gib. That was an awesome talk, awesome Q&A. The biggest metric you should be proud of is look how many butts are still in seats. Yeah. <laughs> Normally, when it's like the talk is done and it's Q&A time, at least 10, 15, 20% of people instantly go. And I've watched it, like less than 5% of people have... have Took off. So okay, I great. You got a really good. Butts in seats. Yeah. Butts in seats. Butt retention in seats. Butt seat retention. <laughs>